Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. January 21st, year of our Lord, 2024. Yeah, 2024. It is 121-24. Your title today, the day of our Lord will come. Exclamation point. Matter of fact, be excited. The day of our Lord will come. In fact, that term right there you see on the board and the title, the day of our Lord, is very interesting. We're going to look at that towards the end of the message, and you're going to see some interesting principles behind that. Today's title, The Day of Our Lord Will Come, it is lesson number 37, 2 Thessalonians, lesson number 37. Let me get situated and comfortable. Everybody getting frosty and cold? I know even in Florida we are. Believe it or not, in the last couple of weeks, my wife and I have had to cover the plants out in front of the house about three or four different times. Because the early morning frost is creeping up on us. We're getting these mornings where it's 38 degrees and 33. This morning, I think it's 34 with a wind chill, and it feels like 28. And for Florida, Central Florida, um, that's cold. So <laughs> the other day, I think it only made it to like 58 degrees the other day in the middle of the day. So, But I can't complain. I know you guys up north and in different sections uh, even across the Northwest are really getting hammered with a lot of um, really cold weather and a lot of icy rain and everything else. So I'll keep you guys in prayer and you guys keep us in prayer and we'll move forward. I don't have a lot to pray about. I want to kind of jump right into it. We got some really interesting principles. I think it's going to help clarify and I need to say this again every once in a while. If you want my notes, I don't mind sending them to you, but it's simply um, much easier for people to go on PRB Ministry Facebook, not my personal Facebook, Richard Betez. That's where I kind of let my sarcasm and my patriotism fly on there, but PRB Ministry Facebook page, all the notes and all the videos on there. So if you want the notes, I would go there. If you can't get on there or you want the notes personally for yourself, just ask me which one you want. Use the number, like today's number is lesson number 37 in 2 Thessalonians, the date, the title, and I'll be able to find them for you. They're in basic Word document, and I'll send them to you um, if you're interested. Also, in this series, there's a lot unfolding. If you haven't been with me during the beginning of this series, really from the beginning of 1 Thessalonians, but certainly in the last month, two months, um, leading up to where we are now, don't send me questions until you go over all these videos because all I'm going to do is send you the videos that I've taught in the last several months because all the principles are here about the rapture, the tribulation, the abomination of desolation, and we're not done yet. Like I told you, this study in 2 Thessalonians, trying to wrap this last chapter up, these last few chapters up in 2 Thessalonians, is going to take us the bulk of 2024, I think. We'll see, but I believe it is. And... If you have questions, a lot of times um, they're going to be answered if you're just patient and relaxed and really focus and don't miss the messages. Go back and pay attention and stay tuned for the messages to come and the answers will be there. Today's going to answer some things I guarantee that you've had questions about. So let's buckle up and jump into it. I don't have a lot to pray for. We're going to keep our royal family up in North Carolina, Marvin, in prayer um, we had him in prayer the other day, and I know he had a medical emergency, very difficult time, and he is related to our royal family, the Biggs family up there in North Carolina. We want to keep him in prayer, and we're going to pray for each other during this weather. You know, we're going to have a tough winter, it looks like, so I want to keep everybody in prayer with that. So having said that, let's do the most important thing we do, get filled with the Spirit, get in the Word, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow up, you have to take in the Word habitually, filled with the Spirit, new nature. Filling power of God, the Holy Spirit, means that Christ-like nature is opened up. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10, believers... If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, believers, 
He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, filling power of the Spirit. 1 John 1.10, believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and sight any known sins, first and foremost. Secondary, get rid of the distractions. Get ready to focus on the mind of Christ, the most important thing you do. And we will say a quick prayer for everything and everyone. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're lifting up Marvin in prayer, our royal family up in North Carolina. Very faithful people. We want to keep them in prayer. Anytime somebody in a family is struggling, their whole family struggles, we know this, Father. So we're praying for that situation. We're also praying for these weather patterns, these difficult weather patterns across the United States, across the world, really. But certainly these patterns that are causing believers to lose power or be stuck or stranded, having medical emergencies or personal emergencies in their life because of these storms. So, Father, we're praying for your mighty hand in these situations to guide us through. And, Father, we're just praying for growth and strength going into this new year so we can stand strong and become the leaders in our little circle of family and friends and our communities and learn how to lead other people to the truth. First and foremost, leading unbelievers to the gospel. And secondary, leading lost believers to the truth and away from the nonsense and counterfeits in Satan's system. Father, we're praying for all these things and we're praying for one another. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. Open back up today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, our study in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to begin with a couple of principles here. You guys get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As I was saying, opening up this message, let me shift over here a little bit. Opening up this message today, without full knowledge of the subject matter concerning these letters Thessalonica we're looking at to Thessalonica, many people cherry pick a few scriptures and they go off in a different direction. That gets people confused. It got the Thessalonians confused because they listened to some false teaching. In order to gather the true subject matter and what is being taught, you have to understand the complete historic set of events. Very important anytime you're getting serious with scriptures. What's going on in that time? What does the terminology mean? Who's being spoken to? What's the histor historical impact of that time? Are there subtleties in the original language you're missing out on? You need to question all these things. You can't just cherry pick one of two scriptures in a chapter and, and try to build a doctrine around it. Be very careful of that. And a lot of teachers do that, and they shouldn't. They don't understand what's called the ICE principle. Isagogics, categorical doctrines, and exegesis of the word. The concepts behind the letters to Thessalonica was first to back up previous teaching the Apostle Paul established during his short ministry and his setup in Thessalonica, when he originally set up the little church there in Thessalonica. Now, I told you, the Thessalonians, this section is very interesting because he's like 300 miles away when these letters are being written. He's down in Corinth, and Corinth was much more affluent or wealthy set of believers and a nicer group of people as far as money and prestige go, the Thessalonica was more lower and middle class people. They didn't have the funds, all the uh, prestige that those in Corinth had. So right off the bat, though, it's interesting that they grew very quickly while the Corinthian people with education and wealth were the more difficult group of people. So the concept behind the letters to Thessalonica was first to back up previous teaching the Apostle Paul established during his short ministry and set up in Thessalonica. It is believed between four to six weeks were spent establishing a group of believers there in Thessalonica. I covered this principle months ago when we were in 1 Thessalonians. In that time, mystery doctrine was opened up to them. And part of mystery doctrine, you know, really the unfolding of the rapture in the end times becomes very visible in mystery doctrines. One of the doctrines under the umbrella of mystery doctrine, the rapture of the church. 
basic eschatology was taught by Paul, and then it was followed up by Timothy because he came in behind Paul. Paul sent Timothy there to back up the teaching. Within that teaching was the rapture before the seven years of tribulation. They were already taught these things by not only the Apostle Paul, but certain letters that went there, and then Timothy backing it up, going face-to-face -face there as well about the rapture in the seven years of tribulation. Now, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 covers this. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 18 cover this. We've looked at them. We'll probably look at them again today or in the future. So if you look back on 1 Thessalonians 1.10, what is said there in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and where we are now in this letter, you shouldn't be confused about the rapture and the tribulation after the rapture. The reason the Apostle Paul doubled down on this teaching in the first letter is because he knew there was false teaching already beginning to circulate through the islands of Greek, the Greek, uh, excuse me, Greece, the Greek islands. There was already false teaching going on. So he already realized the false teachers and the false narrative had followed him there as well. It was already beginning to circulate. He also knew Thessalonica was coming under great pressure and if you're in a neighborhood or a group of people that are, what we say, lower income and middle class and struggling regular working folk, when you have the pressure of law and order and government and others coming down upon you, it's much more difficult to stand in your beliefs than it is if you are wealthy and affluent in your community. So Thessalonica was facing a lot of pressure. Paul knew all this stuff. He knew the circulation of false doctrine. He knew the status of the believers at Thessalonica, that most of them were very positive. They were, they were trying to grow, and they were being pressured by outside forces, certainly the Greeks and the Romans, but even, you have to realize, the Sanhedrin, anywhere the apostles went, the Sanhedrin wanted to squash out any of the teaching of the apostles as well. So the apostle Paul backed up what he and Timothy had already taught them face to face. He was backing up what was already taught to them, not only face-to-face, -face, but in other letters and other presentations of his teaching. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 on the board. Look at that. What does it say there? Very clear. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who does what? Allows you to go into the wrath of the tribulation. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, right there on the board? Jesus, who rescues us from what? The wrath to come. The wrath to come. You do not find any teaching where the apostles are saying, you guys are stuck here for the tribulation, the worst part of the wrath on earth. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, 17, and 18 are another one. Many of you know these. We covered these months ago. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who died during, the, during this church age, any time after the cross is the church age. Verse 17, Then we who are alive, who remain, who are here during that time, will be, matter of fact, caught up. Harpazo is the word in the Latin. It means rapture. It means kidnapped, scooped up. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet where? The Lord in the air. Not on the earth. In the air. Supernatural. Rapture of the church. And so, we will always be with the Lord. Pretty clear teaching. Now, the second letter to the congregation at Thessalonica was sent only two or three months after the first one. I clarified that with you as well. It was sent because the Apostle Paul found out false teaching and fake letters, fake letters, had now been infiltrating this area. Fake letters with the Apostles' names on them. 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Now we're going to get back into this chapter. I want to read the first couple of verses and we're going to get back on track. 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. I already taught you guys about the rapture, so he's reminding them again. So the main concern 
Historical principle, historical context is important. The main concern was that they had missed the rapture. The main concern was they had missed the rapture because of the outside pressure and ridicule or attacks against Christianity. The great tribulation would soon unfold and these believers, Thessalonians, would be facing the wrath upon earth. That's what they believed. In fact, some of them were being taught they were already living in a tribulation or the beginning of a tribulation. They missed the rapture. That's the big problem with the false teaching. They missed the rapture. They're already in the tribulation. Something happened. It didn't go the way they thought it was going to go, the way the Apostle Paul and Timothy taught them. They followed the false teaching. So they maybe missed the rapture. The great tribulation was unfolding or about to unfold in front of them, and they are going to face the wrath on earth. There was what is called a mid-tribulation rapture and post-tribulation rapture being introduced. I covered these. Again, if you have questions, go back. There was a mid-trib rapture and a post-trib rapture being introduced. In other words, there was some false doctrine related to middle of the tribulation, then the rapture will come. The end of the tribulation, then the rapture will come. I tell you it is pre-trib rapture that I teach, that I believe, that the Bible teaches. So there was a mid-tribulation rapture and a post-tribulation rapture being introduced, and they bought it. So the Apostle Paul reminds them of the gathering together of the rapture first. He's going over principles he already taught them, the chronological order of things. Please understand that. I'll leave that note on the board so you guys can jot it down. Again, I know I'm going to answer almost all your questions if you stick it out with me. Trust me. If you do not understand the historical context, that's where the problems arise. If you do not understand the historical context, then align scripture up with scripture, as well as pick up on the subtle differences in the original language, you may fall for false teaching as well. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people in the year of our Lord 2024 that I see, I see them online and I see some of them are behind pulpits as leaders and they're saying right now we're in the tribulation. It's not true, folks. It's not happening. There are several principles in verse 2 I hope to cover today, and I'll show you them. I'm going to put verse 2 on the board. 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. This is what we're going to focus on today. Look at verse 2. That you not quickly be shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit, small s, not the Holy Spirit, demonic influence, or a message, somebody speaking or teaching you, or a letter as if from us because there were counterfeit letters and teaching going around to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now Paul's going to clarify something. The first scripture you see, 2 Thessalonians 2.1, he mentions the rapture first. Now he's going to get into something else, the day of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, no one is to deceive you in any way, exclamation, because he's very serious. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed and the son of destruction. So they're thinking they're going into the tribulation and they're going to be waiting on the day of the Lord, second advent. What is Paul saying? Don't let anybody deceive you. That's a lie. It will not come. Day of the Lord. Even what happens during the buildup of the tribulation, then the day of the Lord, the second advent, unless... The apostasy comes first. Then the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. In other words, the Antichrist becomes visible, very visible, at the three and a half year mark in the seven year tribulation. 2 Thessalonians 2 4. Who does what? He opposes and exalts himself above every so called God, anything that people worshiped on the earth, or object of worship, so that. He takes his seat in the temple of God, Jerusalem, abomination of desolation. We've studied that. Displaying himself as being God. Three and a half year mark in the tribulation. Let us first look at the concept of the three ways to absorb knowledge. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 2, a spirit, a message, and a letter. A spirit, a message, and a letter. 
Knowledge comes in several forms. Amen. Everybody understand this. One is through the written word. Knowledge comes in several forms. One is through the written word, which implies reading, and not just reading, fully understanding that which you read. Because you can read something in the Bible, but if you don't understand the historical context, some of the original language even, and does it align with other scriptures, how does it align with the rest of the Bible, then you might go off on a tangent on your own. So knowledge comes in several formats. One is through the written word, which implies reading and fully understanding that which you read, very important. The other is teaching. What I'm doing right now verbally, teaching or receiving a verbally articulated message. Again, fully understanding what is being taught matters. In other words, if I don't clarify everything I'm teaching, that's why I tell you to follow, follow me along and stick with me during a series. If, you, if I don't clarify everything which I'm teaching and you're not able to digest it and understand it, then all you've done is hear it. And it, doesn't, it has no opportunity to later turn into wisdom in your life. So teaching or receiving a verbally articulated message is a second way. Again, fully understanding what was taught matters, folks. The last format is very tricky. The last format is spiritual. The last format of learning is spiritual in the sense of either supernatural or a deep subconscious set of thoughts and desires. And I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of Christians, I would say a large portion, and even pastors that follow a deep subconscious set of thoughts and desires that are not from God the Holy Spirit. And they think they've learned something. They read it and they got some kind of message in their dream or however they feel. The emotions are in the minute. And they realize, well, that's what God said to me. I would say, be very careful of the spiritual aspect. Be very careful of the spiritual aspect of learning. Because it's natural for us to dig in our subconscious and pull something out that we thought we desired before or that we thought we heard before, or maybe it feels good to us, I warn you, be careful of the spiritual aspect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Only in true Christianity is there available all three formats, which in turn means the knowledge received can ingrain much deeper and quicker than any other format. Did you know that? Did you know there's a reason that you should sit with your Bible open, if you can. I realize some people have to watch something on an iPad or a phone or whatever. But do you realize if you sit and listen to what I'm teaching, pay attention and focus, have your Bible in front of you reading along as well, and you're filled with the Spirit, that you have all three working in your favor. Only in true Christianity is there available all three formats, which in turn means the knowledge received can ingrain much deeper and quicker than any other way. Any other way. That's why it's very important to get rid of the distractions when you want to study your Bible. Listen, you give God an hour three times a week. Hopefully, you go over the messages and you give Him more than three hours a week, but at least that, if you're with me, at least that. Those That hour that you take should be no distractions and have your scriptures in front of you and that way you're absorbing all three ways. You're filled with the Spirit as well. See, the believer has the option to be inculcated by the eye gate, the ear gate, and spiritual perception all at once while studying. Only in Christianity. I don't care what Allah says. I don't care what Buddha says. I don't care what any other spiritual leader tells you. Only in true Christianity. The believer has the option, you got to take your free will and make a choice, the option to be inculcated by the eye gate, the ear gate, and the spiritual perception all at once while studying. <clears throat> all three working in your favor. And God the Holy Spirit works in that spiritual realm, helping you digest in your new nature all the information. There is no other, pay attention here, there is no other religious or educational system like 
true Christian Bible study. True Christian Bible study. Not somebody walking around on stage laughing and joking and telling you fun stories. Sorry. Not a music ministry filled with a lot of joy and everybody's jumping around and hopping around. I'm talking true Christian Bible study. It's very academic. You got to be focused. There is no other religious or educational system like true Christian Bible study. The two power options I tell you all the time, filling power of the Spirit and the Word circulating, the two power options applied in proper context ensure our unique opportunity for growth. That ensures your unique opportunity for growth. I would tell you, and I say it all the time, you're basically dead in the water without your two power options. You're going nowhere. You're spinning your wheels in the sand without the two power options. Every other system has flaws. Easily infiltrated by counterfeits, lies, and cosmic viewpoint, or even, yes, demonic influence. If you're not filled by the Spirit, and studying the accuracy of the word the right way. I'm going to tell you, every other system, religious, spiritual, whatever it is, is easily infiltrated by counterfeits, cosmic viewpoint, and even demonic influence. I would pay attention to that because there's a lot of Christians today that are led astray. And a lot are in big, big evangelical churches with lots of glossy music ministries and fun stories and exciting things to listen to and do and you get a real sugar high when you go to that church a real sugar high your old sin nature is very deceptive do you know that are you aware of that are you aware of about 80 percent 75 percent of the battle you fight spiritual warfare is with the old sin nature yourself your old sin nature is very deceptive many people rely on deep subconscious influence to lead them into what they assume is accurate knowledge. In fact, I can think back on people I've talked to. There was two people I think, uh, and, I, and both of them I actually worked with when I was in the human service field, and they found out I was into a really staunch Bible study under Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries, and I tried to give them some books and tapes, and I was talking to them even before I was ordained, uh, about the truth and the accuracy of the word. And both of them were claimed to be believers. They knew some scriptures. They would talk to me about scriptures. But both of them had the attitude of a lot of people have, is I have my own relationship with God. I don't need anybody to teach me anything. I just read the Bible, whatever I feel in that moment that God is teaching me. It doesn't matter what the historical context is, what the original language is, what the categories of doctrines and the scripture align with scripture I just know God's telling me that. I just feel God's telling me that. So I don't need all that church stuff and that pastor stuff. Even though it's in the New Testament that there is a gift of pastor teacher and you, you are to be under a teacher. It's in the New Testament. You can kick against it, but it's in the Old Testament as well. What do you think prophets and leaders and priests were for in the Old Testament? Different dispensation. They were teachers and leaders. Your old sin nature is very deceptive. Many people rely on deep subconscious influence to lead them into what they assume. What happens when you assume? You make a you-know-what out of you and me. They assume is accurate knowledge. Because I read my Bible on my own and I just assumed God told me something. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Do you understand the filling power of the Spirit? Do you understand what you really understand what you're reading? Did you put your nose to the grindstone and figure out exactly what you're reading and believing? Does it align with true biblical principles and doctrines? Good question to ask yourself. Any form of learning from the flesh is a deceptive journey. You're on the wrong journey. Any form of learning from the flesh is a deceptive journey. And I'm talking to Christians, folks. This often gives great comfort at first because it feels good. Yet in the end, it leads to frustration or weak decisions. I can tell you there's some people, and I'm talking to Christians, or at least they claim to be, that play uh, like Russian roulette or Ouija board with the Bible. They just flip a, a page open and, 
and circle your finger and go boom, and they point, point to a scripture and say, okay, that's what God's saying to me today. That's the kind of games they play, more or less. Just flip your Bible open, say a quick prayer, and point your finger at whatever scripture, and that's what God's saying to me today. Maybe he is, maybe he's not, I don't know. But don't lead your life like that. Don't lead your studies like that. Any form of learning from the flesh is a deceptive journey. This often gives great comfort at first, because it feels good, yet in the end it leads to frustration or weak decisions. You'll never find any of the leaders in the Old Testament or New, spiritual leaders, that just haphazardly bounced around in the Word and just said, I'm going to try this today, I'll try that. This feels good, that feels good. They was told to stick to the Word. In fact, don't even trust some of their own instincts, flesh. Trusting in your own desires, skills, or traits from the flesh and the subconscious memory bank is nothing more than cosmic viewpoint. I would say 90% of the time. <clears throat> Trusting in your own desires, skills, or traits from the flesh and the subconscious memory bank is nothing more than cosmic viewpoint. If you are not pulling from doctrine in the soul, the library of doctrine in the soul, and the power, more importantly, of God the Holy Spirit, you'll end up in a position of weakness sooner or later. Where you want to be in a position of strength to make decisions and move forward, you end up in a position of weakness. The believers at Thessalonica had been hit from several angles. The counterfeit of the written word, the teaching of false doctrine, and really a spirit of deception. There are spirits in the world, folks. If they're not from God, then they have to be from Satan. Amen? So don't play around with thinking, well, there's no real spiritual influence or anything like that. There's spiritual influence. Trust me when I tell you. But there's only two camps. I tell you all the time. There's not a third camp where you sit at your little fireplace and say, well, I got my own little camp over here, away from God and away from the devil, and I'll make my own decisions. No, you're on the devil's camp. He's just got you fooled. There's only two. The believers at Thessalonica had been hit by several angles, pressure. The counterfeit of a written word came into them, the teaching of false doctrine came into them, and a spirit of deception overthrew many of them. All believers need to step back and evaluate what they listen to, what they watch, how they learn. And that includes what I'm teaching you. Step back and evaluate. See what aligns. Luke 8.18 tells us what? So, Luke 8.18, take care how you listen. Yeah, yeah, I know about that. I have my own version of what Pastor Rick just taught. Okay. Luke 8.18, take care how you listen. For whoever has to him, more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he or she has will be taken away from him or her. Luke 8.18 says the same thing, I believe it's in Mark as well. That which you accept as truth has to be backed by the foundational principles from God. Are they backed? by the foundational principles of God, does it align with the plan and the word of God? Because if it doesn't, it will be taken away. It will be shattered sometime down the road. That which you accept as truth has to be backed by foundational principles from God. Proverbs 2.2 2 and Deuteronomy 32.46 on the board. If you grab a drink, we'll read these. And again, i got to show you some of these scriptures as a wake-up. Many believers need a wake-up call in this area. Proverbs 2.2, 2, make your ear attentive to wisdom. And we know wisdom, Sophia, in the Bible often used, Sophia is the term for wisdom often used, has to do with digested doctrine. Stuff that you have taken in and you, you rely on it. Now you put your faith in it. It changed you. Now you apply it. But make your ear attentive to wisdom, doctrine that's applicable. Incline your heart, your soul, lean into your understanding what's being taught. Proverbs 2.2, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart 
Make sure your soul is leaning in to full understanding of Bible doctrine. Deuteronomy thirty-two forty-six. He said to them, take your heart to your heart in your soul. All the words with which I am warning you today, which you will command your sons and daughters to follow carefully all the words of the law. At that time, dispensation of Israel, the law means the word of God, my commands, my words. Deuteronomy thirty-two forty-six. He said to them, take to your heart. What does it mean, take to your heart? It means be open to it, seek it, and take it in. Make it your own. You don't make something your own that you don't put faith in. You don't take something in that you don't take your time and really study and absorb it, and then it changes you unless you have the faith and the trust to sit and digest it and say, I'm going to accept this as the truth because it seems like it's right because I've studied it and I'm filled with the Spirit and I'm going to absorb it and now I'm going to believe it and later on try to apply it. Deuteronomy thirty-two forty-six. he said to them, take to your heart, in your soul, all the words, Bible doctrine, with which I am warning you today, which you will command, in other words, parents, Command to your children to follow carefully all the words of the law. That would mean today, in this dispensation of the church age, all the words of the teaching of Jesus Christ and the apostles. Bible doctrine. Satan wants to distract the born-again believer with everything but the accuracy and the real study of the mind of Christ. Let me say that again. That might be a good t-shirt. <laughs> For the next Bible conference. Satan wants to distract the born again believer with everything but the accuracy and real study of the mind of Christ. Well, I'm a believer, so Satan's going to leave me alone now. Oh, you're wrong. You are wrong. He cannot take your salvation from you. Nobody can. He can distract you. He can influence you. Him and his army, they cannot possess a believer's soul, but they can deeply influence Satan wants to distract the born-again believer with everything but the accuracy and real study of the mind of Christ. That's why we have six different denominations in Christianity or two dozen denominations or different spiritual movements that try to label themselves Christian in some form or fashion. It's all a big distraction. He wants believers to become frustrated in the long run and they become useless inside the pre-designed plan of God. That's a win. If you become frustrated and useless for the plan of God for your life, that's a win. That's as close as they can get to a win, the fallen angels. The believers at Thessalonica lost some momentum. Satan was having victories with these people. The believers at Thessalonica lost some momentum, forward motion, because a few believers, that's all it was, allowed false doctrine into their midst. Just a few. Just a little leaven. Leavens the whole lump of dough. Hebrews 2, 1, James 1, 2 on the board. Hebrews 2, 1, for this reason. Hebrews 2, 1, for this reason, believers, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not, what, drift away from the truth. So that we do not drift away from the truth. This is written for our benefit because that was what was happening back then. Multiply that by 2,000 years of Satan and his army. Hebrews 2, 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, the teaching, the accuracy, so that we do not drift away from it. James 1, 2. James 1, 2. But prove yourself, what? Doers of the word. You can't do something you don't have faith in. You can't do something you haven't been taught. Listen, if you've never hung a piece of drywall at a construction site to make a wall, and I just threw a, a drill at you and some drywall and said, go ahead and do it. You've never done it. Nobody ever taught you. You never sat down and learned. You didn't apprentice in or, under anybody. And then you didn't try to apply it and fail and learn the right way. James 1, 2, prove yourself, believers, Doers of the word, not just hearers 
who deceive themselves. Not just hearers who deceive themselves. The only victory the kingdom of darkness can have in your life, believer, is to assist you toward becoming an emotional wreck or a religious zealot like a Pharisee. Listen to me, let me say this again. The only victory the kingdom of darkness can have in the life of any believer is to assist them toward becoming an emotional wreck or a religious zealot. Either or. At least you don't lose your salvation. Amen to that. They gain a victory over you by you becoming a loser believer in time. It's a small victory. Satan will take what he can get. Trust me when I tell you. You become a loser believer in time. So the crowns, blessings, and rewards, and your job, your calling inside God's plan in the temple right now are all skewed because Satan had a victory in your life. Don't worry. God's got a plan. He'll figure it out. Amen? He doesn't even need us. He gives us the privilege to stand up in this angelic warfare, this angelic conflict, and stand with him. He gives us the privilege. The only victory the kingdom of darkness can have in the life of a believer is to assist them toward becoming an emotional wreck or religious zealot. They can gain a victory over you, any believer really, by you becoming a loser believer in time. Psalms 101.3 on the board. Proverbs 14.12. Let me grab a drink. You guys can take a note on these. When I started looking at these formats of learning and how we fall away from learning the right way, I came up with about 50 scriptures. So I'm only putting the ones on there that I think really held my attention. But there are plenty in the Bible. Psalms 101.3. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless, the eye gate. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. That's why sometimes you have to separate from people. Sometimes it's, a, it's just a mental separation from somebody. Other times you have to physically separate. Psalms 101.3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Listen, it's tough to watch a movie nowadays without every alternative lifestyle and every crazy thing on the TV. You know, you want to just relax and unwind and watch a movie. And there's always got to be something in there with you-know-what lifestyles, all this different thing, very ungodly things. So what do you got to do? You end up fast-forwarding. So my wife and I do a lot of times, fast-forwarding. So you lose portions of a movie. Do you realize, and I've said this before with groups of people, my wife and I have even discussed this, you could show... A scene, even with a man and a woman, that are going to become intimate. And another thing the movies promote, don't let me get sidetracked, but another thing the movies promote is sex outside of marriage. That's what they think is cool. We all were raised thinking it was cool. But the movies promote that. But do you realize that in a movie, all you have to do is show a man and a woman embrace and kiss and then open up the next scene the next morning with them coming out of the bedroom or whatever. And that's enough. Everybody gets it. Why do you think it's so graphic? And why do you think even now we have different lifestyles being displayed as normal? Who do you think's in control of Hollywood? I already told you one time before, I believe, on one of my messages, that do you realize the ancient wizards back in the day and the soothsayers and the sorcerers and witchcraft and the druids would break a limb off the holly tree because they believe it had a lot of energy in it. The holly tree, they would take a piece of holly wood and use it as a magic wand. A piece of holly wood and use it as a magic wand so that they could tell a vision and program somebody. A lesson for another day. Proverbs 14.12 there is a way which seems right to a person, but in its end is a way of death. There's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. God likes the right thing done in the right way, meaning his way, paying attention to certain details. Folks, do not trust 
in the wisdom of the world or the thoughts of your old sin nature. Be careful. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us what? Pay attention to this one. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart, your soul, will you do your thinking? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Yes, your old sin nature, Jeremiah 17, 9. You want a good description of your flesh? Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And no, 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 your flesh doesn't get better as you get older. It probably gets worse, amen? Your new nature is what you want. 1 Timothy 4, 1, but the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul teaching Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1, but the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, down the road, the Apostle Paul is saying, some will fall away from the faith. Believers, some will fall away from the faith. Believers paying attention to what? Deceitful spirits and doctrines or teachings of demons. Got a lot of that today in the church. Deceitful spirits. My pastor makes me laugh. Every Sunday when I go, he tells me fun stories. And we got a great music ministry and we fed the poor in that neighborhood. Good for you. It's all good. Fine and good. How much doctrine do you have in you? That's where it begins. That's where it begins. That's the question you ask. How much real doctrine do you have? How do you really understand and apply the word in your life? Deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. What began in the days of the apostles, establishing the early church of Jesus Christ, and the counterfeits against that, has only increased. It's only increased and become much more deceptive over time. I think my wife was telling me something this morning about a saying about Satan, uh, and he's, his, his evil is so um, persuasive because he's been around so long, because he's so old. Don't forget, Satan was around in eternity past. He led a rebellion. Of all angels. And the earth, the original rock of the earth, was created for them, the fallen ones. Again, if you've been with me for a while, this makes sense. Maybe you haven't read my book, Angels Fallen and Elect. Send me an email with your address, I'll send you a copy. You see, the right thing done in the right way matters to God. Our God is also a God of details and accuracy. Details and accuracy. Nothing is haphazard or sloppy inside the plan of God. Nothing is haphazard or sloppy inside the plan of God. In 2 Timothy 2.1, it says what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, rapture, 2 Timothy 2.1, if you were with me last lesson, I spent over an hour on that. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, rapture. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, that the day of the Lord has come, second advent. Well, how do you know that? Stick with me a few more minutes. The day of the Lord is almost always used for the second advent. Did you know that? 2 Timothy 2, 2, just look at the subtle differences in 2 Timothy uh, 1 and then 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2, 1, 2 Timothy 2, 2. The day of the Lord has come, second advent. The day of the Lord is almost always used for the second advent. Now, the original King James Bible was very liberal taking out Christ and placing Lord, or many times vice versa, in scriptures in the 1500s, the King James Version. This was one where it was written Messiah, Christ, by King James and his scribes, yet the original manuscript has Lord, Curios. Did you know that? If you didn't, you know it today. The original case, this gets people confused, and I'm going to say something on this matter, and there are people that kick against this, and they're looking for little detail fights to get into. The original King James Bible was very liberal, taking Christ 
and placing Lord or vice versa many times in Scripture. This one, where it's written Messiah, Christ by King James, if you have a King James, certainly the original, and his scribes, yet the original manuscript, it was Kyrios, Lord. It was Lord. See, there are heated debates about the original terms in the Hebrew for Adonai and Jehovah, Jehovah, spellings or misuse of terms for Elohim, God, as well as how the word Lord was replaced by King James and his scribes or put into use in some scriptures and changed in others. All kinds of debates. Variations and root words were also used for false gods in many of those titles I just showed you. See, I see a lot of this online. I don't get involved in it. Sometimes I'll pass something. And I don't. Sometimes I won't put a thumbs up or I won't say anything, and I can answer a question for somebody, but I know where it's going, and I'm not going to waste my time taking away from my study for you to get into these debates with people. I've done it a few times. It's crazy. I'm not doing it anymore. There are heated debates about the original terms, certainly when it comes to the King James changing things. There are heated debates about the original terms in the Hebrew for Adonai and Jehovah, spellings or misuse of terms for Elohim, God, as well as how the word Lord was replaced by King James and his scribes or put into use in some scriptures and changed in others. Yes, it did happen. Variations and root words were also used for false gods of any of those titles. Most of this is distractions. I'm telling you. And the men in my lineage would tell you the same thing. Most of this is just distractions. The original context and the scriptures are firmly established. Now you're getting into all kinds of distractions. When I use the term God or Lord, I know exactly what's in my heart. Do you? When I use the term God or Lord, I know exactly what's in my heart, and so does the one true God. Amen. Having clarified that, let's go down to the meat and potatoes here of what's on our plate today. The day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the rapture. The day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, points us to the rapture. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures, so if you don't have your pad and pen ready, I would suggest getting it. Let me grab a drink. We're going to close out with me clarifying exactly what the day of Jesus Christ and the day of the Lord Jesus Christ and the day of the Lord by itself means. I'll let the Bible speak to you. How's that? Philippians 1.6, the Apostle Paul writes what? Philippians 1.6, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. Rapture. Believers. Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, the Apostle Paul writes, that he who had began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus, the rapture. Apostle Paul is the professor of mystery doctrine. I think he knows what he's talking about. Amen. Address to believers. We will all be complete or done with our temporal walk on the day of the rapture. Listen, however far you've grown on the day of the rapture or the day you go home to be face to face with the Lord, that's it. A lot of people say, well, I'll have time for God in heaven. I'll study and I'll do this. No, no, no. All your crowns, blessings, and rewards, and your rank and file are placed right now in time. What you're going to be for all of eternity. This is addressed to believers. We will all be complete or done with our temporal walk on the day of the rapture. In fact, Philippians 1.10, mark that one down. Philippians 2.16, mark that one down. Same thing. Same thing as Philippians 1.6. Go into Philippians 1.10. Look down a few verses. Philippians 2.16, the next chapter over. Whatever spiritual growth you have achieved on the day of your death or the day of the rapture, you are complete in your personal race, your personal journey. 
The day you're face to face with the Lord, whether it's a rapture or your death, that's it. That's your race. Your race has been run. The Apostle Paul continues in the same line of teaching about the day of Christ, rapture. It is a time our work is done and the time for evaluation what happens after the rapture. Bema see judgment of Christ takes place after the rapture. Bema see judgment of Christ. Look at 2 Peter 3.10 on the board. This one starts to talk about the second advent. They're very different than the rapture. 2 Peter 3.10. If you've been with me for a couple of years, many of these will make sense to you. 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord, second advent, will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away and a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. That's not the rapture. And the earth and its works will be discovered. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4 goes into that as well. Second Advent. 2 Peter 3, 10 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 4. The day of the Lord, Second Advent. None of this that I'm reading to you on the board, 2 Peter 3, 10, points to the rapture. The rapture is not a day when there's fire and the earth changes and everything shifts and all this horrible stuff comes. The rapture is a mystery to most people on the earth. The second advent begins with a supernatural set of events, I keep telling you, that shifts and rocks the whole earth. Then a battlefield massacre occurs. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ steps down on the Mount of Olives as the warrior king. And he, Jesus Christ, has the highest body count on the battlefield. Then there's a baptism of fire. Then there's a cleaning process. And then the thousand-year millennial reign begins. Day of the Lord, second advent. Day of the Lord, second advent. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 through 9 on the board. Look at this one. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 through 9. So that, the Apostle Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, you are not lacking in any gift, believers, Corinthians, as you eagerly await what? The revelation, mystery doctrines, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Jesus Christ. Rapture. Verse 8. Who will also confirm you to the end, blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rapture. 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship, believer, with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Rapture of the church age believers right there 1 Corinthians 7 8 and 9 1 Corinthians 1 7 8 and 9 1 Corinthians 1 7 so that you are not lacking in any gift believer as you eagerly await the revelation the coming and the mystery of the rapture of our Lord Jesus Christ verse 8 who will also confirm you in the end blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.8 is speaking about the rapture. God is faithful through whom you were called, believer, into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Rapture of the church age believers. The rapture. The day of the Lord ushers in the final great white throne judgment if you don't know the difference between the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ after the rapture and the Great White Throne Judgment at the end of the thousand year reign, beginning of eternity, you haven't been studying your Bible. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5. here's another one on the board. Folks, we're going to wrap this up. You write them down. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5. I've decided to turn such a person over to Satan, the Apostle Paul said. Somebody that wouldn't want to repent, they wouldn't turn around. For the destruction of the body, and are they a believer? So Paul says, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Maybe he's a believer. If it is, he'll be saved on the day of our Lord. What does that mean? There he's pointing to the second advent because he knows, Paul knows, at the second advent, afterwards, the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, there's a great white throne judgment. The apostle Paul handed a negative believer over to the sin unto death. 
1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. He's assuming he's a believer. He's making a very generalized statement here about a believer who was negative that wouldn't accept Paul's advice and Paul trying to reconcile the situation that Corinth had a lot of situations. The Apostle Paul handed a negative believer over to the sin unto death. Reference to never losing your salvation, really. Even if you approach the end times as a believer, you are saved from the great white throne judgment after the second advent reign on earth. After Christ has gone through his physical kingdom, thousand year reign, second advent begins at the battle of Armageddon when he steps down, and then the thousand year reign will follow. At the end of that is a great white throne judgment. Paul's making a generalized statement in 1 Corinthians 5 5. Maybe this person's a believer, but I can't reconcile with him. I tried. I'm just going to give them over. Whatever happens, happens. And in the end, you know what? If they're a believer and they're here during that time, they won't, if they're a believer, face the final judgment on the day of our Lord. The Apostle Paul made a generalized statement here, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5, general statement that even if the end times happen tomorrow, our spirit is saved even as the sin unto death takes us home. Do you know King Saul died the sin unto death? Do you know it's, it's possible that Samson died the sin unto death? But they're in heaven. We never face final judgment, amen? We never face final judgment. Acts 2.19 on the board. Look at Acts 2.19. And I will display wonders in the sky above the signs on the earth below. When is this? Can't be the rapture, because the rapture is a mystery for a lot of people on the earth. Blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. Acts 2.19. Look at Acts 2.20. The sun will be turned into darkness. That's not the rapture. And the moon into blood. That's not the rapture. Before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. That's the build up to the second advent. That's not the rapture. Let us close with some Old Testament warnings about the second advent. We'll go through these quickly and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Old Testament prophecies and how they use the term. Very similar in the New Testament. Malachi 4.5 Behold, I'm going to send you Elisha, the prophet, before the coming of what? The great and terrible day of the Lord. Talking about the seven-year tribulation buildup and then when the Lord returns. Malachi 4, 5, right there. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amos, here's another prophet, Amos 5, 18. Woe to you who are longing for the day of the Lord, second advent. For what purpose will the day of the Lord, second advent, be to you? It will be darkness, not light. It will be darkness, not light. Second advent. When Christ returns, it's not a pleasant time until he cleans house. Malachi 4, 5 on the board. Amos 5, 18 on the board. Right there, day of our Lord. Second advent. Obadiah, here's another one. Obadiah 1, 15 and Isaiah 13. Obadiah 1, 15. For the day of the Lord is near for all nations, the whole world. Just as you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. In other words, God will pay everybody back for all their evil and wrath. Don't worry about it. Let God handle it. But notice the day of the Lord, Obadiah 1.15, Second Advent. Isaiah 13.6. Isaiah 13.6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. Second Advent. It will come as destruction. That's not the rapture. From the Almighty. The tribulation is said to be God allowing wrath on the earth to not only uh, finish and complete a payment to what's owed to the nation of Israel, but also to deal with evil on this earth one time and reset the earth back to a perfect position. Isaiah 13, 6, for the day of the Lord, second advent is near. It will come as destruction for the Almighty. Ezekiel 13, 5, here's another one. You have not gone up into the breaches, nor did you build up a stone wall 
around the house of Israel to stand in the battle Armageddon on the day of the Lord. Second advent, right there, Ezekiel 13, 5. Very plain. Very plain. Battle of the day of our Lord. Second advent, Ezekiel 13, 5. There are many references to the day of the Lord as a day of destruction, not the rapture, day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1, 7 through 14. I'm not going to cover it today, but you can see I have it in parentheses there. Read Zephaniah 1, 7 through 14. Same thing. The rapture is a day of taking up into the clouds of the air. It's referenced as a celebration and a time of protection from the wrath to come. The day of the Lord points us to a very different event, royal family. It's the second advent of Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. Joel 2, 1 through, what is this one? 1 through 2 or 1 through 3? Joel 2, 1. Let's close with this. Joel 2, 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Joel 2, 1. For the day of the Lord is coming. Indeed, it is near. Second Advent. Joel 2, 2. A day of darkness and gloom, not the rapture. A day of clouds and thick darkness, not the rapture. As dawn is spread over the mountains, so there's a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it. Second Advent, tribulation too as well. Nor will there be anything again after it to the years of many generations. Nothing like it before in history. Day of the Lord, Second Advent. I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.